We'll do it live! F*** it! Kyle Thomas. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for coming on the show. It's an honor. Thanks for having me. I'm trying to get myself set up here. <laughs> While you do that, I'm going to sound off on your credentials. Singer and now guitarist for the legendary, I'm going to call it a thrash band, Exhorter. Singer for legendary doom metal band, Trouble. And last but not least, singer for Alabama Thunder Pussy. Am I right? That is all. That is all correct. Uh, yes. Legendary. Legendary part. I'm not sure about yet, but uh, I'll leave that. Uh, so I'll be the case. judge. I'll be the judge of that. <laughs> this is my show, and I'm That's saying indeed. legendary. I well, think I mean, you got a a Saints man cave banner there, so I think everything's going to be okay. Believe it or not, this is a closet. <laughs> <laughs> I could touch both walls. Well, there you go. But it works. Yeah. And 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 what about this? Does this look familiar? Oh, wait. Hang on. My, I'm in the, that corner. Oh, the World's Fair. Look at that. Yes. Do you remember it? I certainly do. I had season passes that my parents had gotten from my brother and me. And uh, we used to ride because being a West Banker, I uh, we used to get dropped off at the gondola. Mm. And do the you know the sky lift over the river, which was mm. really cool. Um, yeah, and we'd go down there with friends, and we were teenagers, and we'd get wasted. Uh, <laughs> why did, why these grown ups were selling us booze? I don't know, but they did. It's New Orleans, that's why. Yeah, I mean, it was the eighties. Yeah, I had a pass as well. I still have my ID somewhere in my archives. It's funny. I was, yeah, I was in, um, I want to say, fifth or sixth grade at the time. Oh, wow. I was older than that. I was uh, I was 14 that, that summer. Yeah, um, and what about this? Zay, brah. <laughs> no telling lies. Yeah. yeah. My, uh, wait until the summer's gone. That song kicks in and makes you want to flip tables. They're the one band I've probably been listening to almost my entire life. The Zebra used to play high school dances when my sisters were in high school. Yeah, my older brother saw Zebra at St. Christopher. I did see some shows there, but I never saw Zebra there. To be honest, I've, I've only seen Zebra once in my life, believe that or not. But it was uh, the setting was spectacular. I saw them on... Uh, the Rock and Roll Super Bowl at Tad Gormley Stadium with Journey, Foghat, Zebra, and Brian Adams opened nice. the show. And it was wow. slightly rainy day. It was spectacular. The second concert I ever went to, and, mm -hmm. and Zebra was just lights out. They were, they were awesome. That's a great memory. Um, I've th They're the one band I've never seen. Wow. And Yeah, and I've seen a ton. What I want to do today is I want to go on a journey together, much like we just did. The World's Fair and Zebra, yeah. and I want to go on a journey, and, and through that journey, I want to talk about your career. As a fan, it's such a joy to see you doing something that started 30-plus years ago. Today, is I think, is stronger than ever. I could be wrong on that, but... Yeah, um, the, the, the strangest irony about this band, this band that has broken up and gotten back together and broken up and gotten back together countless times... Even even when this band's not together, it gets bigger. Mm -hmm. So when we're working it, which is what we're doing right now, it gets exponentially bigger. So at, at, in, in all honesty and in fairness, the band is bigger now than it's ever been. And I it's believe just, that. Uh, it's still ascending and quickly. Our, our numbers are just exploding on social media right now. Mm -hmm. And um, we're about to enter the studio next month to start recording the follow-up to more in the Southern skies with nuclear mm -hmm. blast. Uh, the labels oh, are cool. excited about That's the great. direction of the new song. So we're, we're stoked, man. We've we're chomping at the bit, but you know, the, the overall sound and, and attitude of the band is still there. I mean, granted I'm 52 going on 53. Uh, the, you know, the youngest person in the band is 47. So, you know, like to, to us, he's the kid, but you know, he's, 
he's a dad like us. He's, you know, it, we're all just much wiser and definitely uh, more reeled in than we were when we were young. So uh, it's, it's, it's all about business now. And it's a mm-hmm. much different mindset. You know, we still have a good time, but yeah, the, the whole idea now is to treat it as a business, treat it like a job and, mm-hmm. and get out there and get the job done. And, and, and in doing so, we're basically uh, reaching new heights. So it, it's exciting for sure. Yeah. I think, um, I think that goes for, for a musician or anyone in life that's our age, you know, if you're not in your fifties and you haven't learned from the things that you did in your twenties, thirties, and even forties, then you, you, then you wasted a lot of time, you know, Um, you got to take that knowledge, walk with knowledge wisely, like crowbar would say, and use it, you know, use those bumps and, and scars that you've, you've created and use it for good when you're in your fifties and enjoy it. Yeah. The ride sadly is, uh, is much shorter than we realize when we're 10 feet tall and bulletproof as kids uh, yeah, and young absolutely. adults, you know, you just don't think about it. Life's different. Uh, my, uh, my, my night used to start at 10, 11 o'clock at night mm-hmm. on a Friday or Saturday night. And I went out both nights. And now if I even go anywhere on a Friday or Saturday night, and that's around the time I'm starting to think about heading home. <laughs> oh no doubt but that's kind of a good thing because you're more focused on your craft when you do have time to yourself yeah absolutely absolutely i'm i'm definitely a much more diligent worker and just all around more responsible human than i certainly was even in my 30s you know just i, I think uh i think our generation is probably slower to put it together and grow up than our maybe our parents were yeah but, i agree with that you know it, if you're fortunate enough to to turn things around for yourself and 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 get things righted with your ship then um uh, it's never too late no it, it just seems like our generation took longer to adjust to, to life changes yeah yeah uh, I, I know for sure my wife and I've had this discussion. We, we probably coddled and babied our kids a little more than we should have. Absolutely. But, but the guilty world is, is charged. Is, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's a scary world. And when you've got all the information in, you know, a piece of equipment this big that goes into your back pocket everywhere you go and you yeah. can read about all these things. It's not like those things weren't happening before. Right. But kind of out of sight, out of mind. And, I, I don't know. I just, I, I'm, I'm grateful that I protected my kids because they're all still alive and, and doing well. But at yeah. the same time, they didn't, they, they didn't have the, I guess the, the free reign that I had not to say my parents let me do whatever I wanted. Cause they certainly didn't. I, I just happened to get away with a lot more because, you know, there was no, gps tracking app that could tell them where i was at any time um, yeah right and, and, and you can and you could be sold alcohol at 14 at the world's fair <laughs> yes so thanks for the thanks for the season pass mom and dad <laughs> yeah i mean that was a time when you jump on your bmx bike and you'd be gone all day long yeah. sometimes into the night and you won't even be home yes. you're just hitting trails you're going places you shouldn't be going there's no way i would let my kids do the stuff that we were doing in the 80s exactly. no way not today i'm with you and I'm who knows you. you know maybe maybe the dangers were just as dangerous back then and we just got lucky you know and and, and we're just getting information overload that you know that that we have access to information and statistics i don't know it seems worse today though it, it may very well be um you know the the bigger the information I, uh, the bigger the information system, uh, I guess, the bigger the opportunity mm-hmm. for people. And and I don't know, maybe people get ideas that they wouldn't have gotten had they not had uh, that information privy to them. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. It, it's 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 tough, you know. But look back in like 
the Kublai Khan days, you know, it, you know, tell them things are, were better than. You know? <laughs> like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I do, and I do that. I, I think like that for sure. So speaking of the eighties, let's go back to the eighties. Um, as far as metal goes, right. What, what, like for me, early MTV started metal for me. I was attracted to like Ozzy, Iron Maiden, ACDC, um, Quiet Riot, Come On, Feel the Noise. You know, those that that early, that was my exposure to metal where I felt something. I was like, that, whatever that is, that's what I like. What was that moment for you? Um, to be fair, I, I had an advantage that not everybody had. I, I have siblings that are 10, 7 years older than me that, that were bringing things into the house mm-hmm. that... Uh, that other kids at school weren't all listening to some were, but you know, I, I, I can remember being a kid on uh, riding in the family car mm-hmm. and, you know, Led Zeppelin came on and my sister's cranking it up or ZZ top. So, you know, Alice Cooper, these things were heavy and, and I had access to, you probably won't remember this at, uh, since you're significantly younger than me, but they used to have a show called the midnight special that came on Friday nights, I think. And they would play videos of bands as well as live footage interviews, that sort of thing. So I got to see David Bowie queen, you know, Alice mm-hmm. Cooper, the cars, mm-hmm. yeah, kiss all this stuff. And um, so because we didn't have MTV, that was pretty much our weekly. Well, this is rock and roll. And this is your mm. opportunity. So there we were in second, third grade, first grade, even uh, mm. fight fighting to stay up late enough to catch the show. So I got exposed to a lot of that. My sisters uh, bought us Kiss records for uh, you know for our birthdays and for Christmas and that sort of thing. So Kiss really Kiss and Queen were really the ones that my brother and I were. You know, we were very similar in age. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we were just whatever album the other got, we would just listen together, you know, or when one's tired of an album, you take it into your room and uh, let them have one of yours. And so it started with that. But it was really, I, I want to say around sixth grade, my brother came home with uh, with Dire of a Madman. Mm. Ozzy, Ozzy Osbourne and I, I hated it at first because my brother loved it eventually I couldn't deny it and then it was ACDC, Judas Priest Iron Maiden and I just the heavier the better it just got and then, you know eventually I found Slayer and Metallica and then hardcore bands like Corrosion Conformity, DRI Dead Kennedys and uh, I just I could never get enough it was like there was just uh my brain was a sponge and i just wanted to to know all of it and and plus at the time i was playing musical instruments so of course i had to learn how to play these songs and everything and it just it consumed me and there was nothing else that i wanted yeah i i like all kinds of music um yeah like madonna you know all that early 80s stuff um i loved it all you know uh, but yeah. there was something about hearing diary of a madman you know that that yes. made the goosebumps come up that's yeah. that that tone and the in the in the crunch i remember like joan jett yes that's just in kindergarten first grade was just like i like that it's gigantic it's big and and she's you know she's one of the biggest vocal influences in my life man she's wow. tough and rough around the edges and you know do you want to touch yeah that song, man yeah. i i I could crank the shit out of that. You know, I, I love I love her version better than the original. It's just nasty and down yeah. in there. And it's, you know, she had that punk edge, but it was big rock, too. Uh-huh. But uh, I did say something the other day to my wife when we were talking about it. I said, you know, I, I probably should give her more props as an influence because the early the early stuff that I was exposed to by her uh on MTV, you know, and mm-hmm. then, you know, l- later on in life, discovering the runaways and stuff. Yeah. Everything you said about her is just spot on. And you know what? My brother, my older brother, he's probably your age, maybe a little bit older, but he's, he lives in Huntsville 
and we we talk about music a lot and um he saw Joan Jett in Huntsville and he said she rocks I caught her about eight years ago or so um no no it was longer than that it was more like 10 wow was it really that long ago might have been 10 Probably. 12 years ago um I saw her <laughs> at the IP casino in Biloxi mm. and it was spectacular, man. She, she played all the stuff you'd want to hear. Um, and, and then some, you know, they, she played some runaways stuff, uh, really did it really put on a hell of a show and the band was mm. great. And, uh, I couldn't have asked for more. It was spectacular. So we're in the eighties. You auditioned for exhorter with the Exodus song. Um, what was it? Deliver us to evil. What year did you try out and sing that song for Exhorter? Uh, they started putting everything together in late 85. So the, the original lineup of the band, minus me, had started working on things late 85, early 90, or, or, or late 85, early 86 ish. Mm -hmm. So um, I started going to, to punk rock shows in. Uh, the winter of 85 and they were going to the shows too. And I'd bump into them at the shows and, you know, we were like, you know, just casually getting to know each other and such. And then it, it turned out that I was talking, I think it was Andy Villafara, our original bass player. I was talking with him and I was like, yeah, you know, I, I sing. He's like, well, we're looking for a singer. I was like, okay. So, um, and I casually knew Chris nail, our drummer, Mm -hmm. just from being a West banker and he's just a year older than me, Catholic school guy, same thing, you know? So, um, you know, I, I just got to talking with him. He's like, yeah, we rehearsed at my house, uh, in my bedroom, uh, once a week. So once you come and, and I want to say it might've been April or May. Mm -hmm. So right at the end of my, I was 16 years old. I was wow. a sophomore in high, sophomore in high school. Mm -hmm. So right at right at the end of my sophomore year was when I had started uh, going over there. And, and from the moment I opened my stupid freaking mouth, they uh, they were all like, oh, yeah, this is it. <laughs> cool. That's awesome. Um, I have a friend I was just talking to the other night. His name is Andy Bergeron. And um, we've been lifelong friends. And he's a playing a band called Estrange. And he, he sent me I told him where I was going to interview you. And he sent me the old flyers from the VFW Hall. Yes, order. I'm going to flash some of these flyers up on the screen. Um, oh, cool. Yeah. 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 I remember Strange. I, I like the Strange. They were, awesome. They were fun. He'd love to hear yeah. that. That's great. Right on. I want to go into Louisiana music and, and Louisiana hard rock and metal. And, and I put Zebra at the top. Like, this is just me speaking, but feel free to interject and add what you think. But I put Zebra at the top. Uh -huh. Like, major label saw two videos on mtv and then i put lily and axe what do you think yeah i mean they were the first two for sure um so so zebra was the first and like you said atlantic records i, I think their debut album at the time it's probably been usurped since then mm -hmm. uh but at the time they i think they sold more copies than any other uh of a debut album than any other band Not at bad. that time. I mean, they were all over MTV. I remember watching yeah. MTV one day and seeing it. I was like, that, that's not the zebra from here, is it? Because mm -hmm. I'd never seen them. I just knew about them. And I was mm -hmm. like, well, it's got to be. You know, they, they, they're they killer. You <laughs> know, And turns right. out it was. Yeah. And then, yeah, uh, I used to go see Lily and Axe play when I was, you know, at, at St. Christopher's when I was in high mm. school. And uh, in fact, uh, Danny King plays drums for our black sabbath tribute now so so yeah they were they were on mca i think um and um i, I want to say they did one or two albums on on mca and then after that they they switched labels well that brings me to my third exhorter two records on roadrunner is a big deal and you're still 30 years later playing those songs exhorter survive the test yeah, of time, still the test of time yeah. without a doubt and i think those records slaughter in the vatican and the law are talked about today where there are a ton of bands that roadrunner will put before you guys that aren't talked about anymore yeah the, the, the uh 
Slaughter in the Vatican especially gets a lot more love than the law. And understandably that's, that's so. That's surprising. Do you really say understandably so? Why do you say that? Yeah. It, uh, the law is my least favorite of the disorder albums. It, it's, hmm. it's, uh, it's, not, it's not that it's not good, and it's not that it's not. It, it certainly is a complex album with a lot of great moments on it but it, mm. it's a very dis it's a very disjointed record we were not mm. prepared to go mm. into the studio and record that album we were still we were still writing that album when it came out that that's why the black sabbath song got put on there because we didn't have enough songs oh i'm so glad that you said that uh, but i'll argue this maybe so you know what you just said is true but it had a sound about it that i love most people most people are team slaughter in the vatican for the first two albums but right. there's a strong contingency of people that i've had people tell me you know they base their entire like successful band people like i had based my entire career off of that album and i was like oh yeah no. <laughs> wow you picked the wrong album <laughs> i don't know man i i think you're kind of lost in it i think a lot of people would well i i don't know who knows you're I, right i, have, I mean I have you, a you know opinion. I yeah, but also you it. also see the crowd reactions when you play the songs too. You know, I mean, when you do, you see a difference in crowd reaction when you play Slaughter and Vatican versus the Law, or is it the Without same intensity? Doubt. You do Even, really like, yeah. Hmm. The majority of people overseas would rather hear stuff off of Slaughter and the Vatican. And Interesting. Like, you know, hmm. As complex as some of the like when we would play the Law, mm -hmm. um, you know, people like the Law, but it, it's. It's not a song that flows, so it starts, stops, does all these different yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of times that goes over people's heads. So uh, the right. hardest song on Slaughter in the Vatican is the tragic period, and it's a monumental, epic, masterpiece of a song. And when we play it live, it's almost like crickets. People just... Wow. You know, That's you, interesting. You, you, you get hmm. people who are purists and people who are, like, diehard fans, and, and they love it. Yeah, yeah. But that, the average listener is going to gravitate more towards legions of death because it's a verse chorus, verse chorus kind of yeah. song versus, you know, all these time signature changes and all sure. this crazy stuff. So I never, I, I wasn't really exposed to exhorter until later. And that was one through that metal maniacs. Cause back then we didn't have the internet. It was metal maniacs, pit magazine, you know, yep. it was tape trading. It was talking to some dude with a metal shirt that you'd see in the mall. And next thing you yep. know, you're tape trading. So that's that's kind of how it worked back then. So if, if someone didn't say, hey, this is an exhorter tape or CD, check it out. You 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 know, there was no Internet to stream it, you know. So um, I, so I had a Metal Maniacs. And it, you know the picture I'm talking about around 92? You're in a pair of cut off shorts with no shirt. Yep. And you're like. Yeah, that was my uh, that was my first full page photo ever in a magazine, and mm -hmm. I was so stoked because when it came out of opening <laughs> up, and I saw my picture, and then I looked at the other side, and it was Tom Araya, and he was like he was facing the direction of me, so it looked like he was smiling and looking at me, and I was like, "Yeah, <laughs> this is great." Do you have a copy of that? I do. I I have a copy of it somewhere in a box in my yeah. attic, probably. I'm flipping through that magazine. I'm like, who's this guy? Because you look different from Tom Araya, from a lot of the thrash bands you'd see. It was different yeah, to see. Yeah, sure. You know? Yeah, it's not so different now. At, no, at no. Time, but back then, though, man, back then yes. in, in 92, 91, when I saw that magazine, I was like, this is different. This is a little bit more hard. I don't know what you would call it, but it wasn't the accustomed heavy hair metal i came out of when i saw that i was no, like that's different it, what it, we we always had a foot in the punk door when we started in new orleans uh the metal scene did not embrace us because no. we were uh we were you know ugly and you know the, the the girls didn't care for it so the people that booked the shows for metal bands had no interest in booking us Mm -hmm. So it was the punk it was the punk rock community that welcomed us and and we That's never cool. forgot that and I gravitated to that you know I started out as a heavy metal kid I did for sure but but once I got in that punk community and that punk mindset I was like it changed me forever for the better and we, we still honor that 
greatly in our music and uh and and our more more importantly our attitude live mm -hmm. yeah I, I dig that i dig it when you mentioned into the void and my my exposure to exhorter was that that image in that magazine and then years later i ended up becoming obsessed with black sabbath and i was really became obsessed with master of reality that's probably my favorite black sabbath record which has my favorite black sabbath song into the void on it and it was really popular back then to cover Black Sabbath and put out a CD. Sure, you know, sure. They had several trivia, and I bought them all. And one of them was this CD right here. It's called Eternal That's Masters. <laughs> I remember it. I remember I've had it well. This, I've had this CD for, I don't know, what year did it come out? 94. I've had the CD since 94. <laughs> uh, that what else was on there? I, know, I think Cannibal Corpse was on there. Yes, and I love it. Zero the Hero. So That's the first song I ever heard from you guys. Nice. Then, of course, I followed your career through Metal Maniacs, mainly. Um, I did get on the internet early 90s, and then I started seeing that you were putting out a new band called Penalty, and I waited for forever, and I'd see it, oh, it's, now it's Floodgate, but the album's going to be called Penalty, and I remember, yeah, get, yeah. I, yeah, I remember getting it, man. And um, There you go, there it is. Yeah, I remember getting it. Not knowing what to expect, you know, this is when you went into it blind, you know, I had, yeah. I didn't know what this was going to sound like until I put it into my CD player at home or my car. And, uh, man, I love the guitar tone. Fuck. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You know, that album was the last few years I was in Exhorter. Um, I was, I was unhappy and, um, Everything that I was writing and submitting as material, the guys were like, man, it's cool, but it's, you know, it's really not exhorter. And, and I can't argue with them now in, in retrospect. I was like, I was just so into the music of my roots, you know, the Black mm -hmm. Sabbath, Led Zeppelin, early, you know, blues, pentatonic based rock. And that's, that's really what happened when, when, uh, I left Exhorter permanently and my brother and I were living both back at home with my, our parents at the same time. It was odd. You know, we, we had both left and lived on our own and then we went back and it was like, we were teenagers again, sitting there late at night, having drinks, you know, burning herb and, and, and just trading riffs on the guitar and bass. You know, I'd played bass for a minute, hand mm -hmm. it to him, take the guitar and vice versa. And we just mm -hmm. do that. And we just constructed you know, a lot of the songs that ended up on that album, we constructed there together mm -hmm. at my parents' house. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then eventually we we picked up uh, Steve Fisher and Neil Montgomery and, and bam, we had Penalty and, and Penalty was on the rise and uh, Roadrunner scooped us up. Um, we started getting a lot of attention and mm -hmm. just as soon as we got out, got the album out, and things started really happening for us. Uh, new metal really exploded, and mm -hmm. the, la the label just kind of gravitated towards that, and just kind of left us on our own. And yeah, uh, yeah, I totally you know, I, saw I, that happen, man. I, yeah. I have a lot of a lot of people that I still correspond with, and you know, just people when I make posts talking about, you know, the, one of the great injustices in rock and roll is that this band didn't get to be you know, one of the bigger bands in the world. And, you know, whether he will never know if that was the truth and, mm. or not, but I felt that way. I, you know, mm. my, my goal with that band was world domination and it just, mm. it just never happened. And and then shortly after it started to fizzle out, I, I started a family and, um, mm. and then, you know, when you got small kids, a lifestyle of touring isn't necessarily uh conducive to raising a family so i i, I oh. took a i took a long break I, I made some albums in between uh pits versus preps mm -hmm. jones's lounge mm -hmm. just to, you know keep just to keep busy and and not lose my san you know my sanity to be honest with you mm -hmm. so um so it really wasn't until right after katrina when the alabama thunder pussy opportunity popped up that that I really like went out and did anything like that again. Mm -hmm. But my child, my children were small and it was like, it was hard on us as a family with me doing it. So after a year and a half of doing that, I, I stopped again until they were older.
Yeah, um, that's a common thing. Um, you do that, you know, you quit something for the family. Yeah. And that something was your identity that actually kind of something that brought in some fame and notoriety and revenue. And it's hard to walk away, but you do it, you cut bait, and then somehow it's like the mafia it brings you back, you know. And then you realize, yeah. nah, yeah. man. It, you know, you got to raise your family. It's it's too late. You know, now you're living for your kids. That was always more important to me than rock and roll. It 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 was in the beginning. It it is also now. My my family, my children are, are far more important to me than playing rock and roll songs. Hmm. But my children are all adults now, so yeah, they don't yeah. need. They don't even necessarily want me around, much less you know, <laughs> you know, need me around. So yeah, uh, it's, it's exciting so, to watch it unfold. I've been lucky enough to uh to to have a another shot at it. So well, might you as super, well make the best of it. You're super talented, man. Um, Thank I you. I mean, I and especially like I had no idea what direction y'all were gonna go, and then I saw Pat O'Brien, and I saw I started seeing the, the live clips pop up, and I was just blown away. I'm like, hell yeah, this is awesome. And you playing guitar, I wasn't expecting that, you know. And I follow this stuff, you know. Yeah. And I was just like, that works. That fucking works. I, I'd like to see that. I'm I'm probably having more fun in this band than I've ever had in my life by you know playing the guitar and and singing as well. Uh, the the lineup that we have right now, I just love the guys. We all get along great, and that's that's been a tough thing for this band is the relationships part. You know, it, it's we've broken up so many times bands that are happy don't break up you know yeah it's tough man i you know with every as as i don't know if this is just an age thing or as i get older but um there's so many things i want to do and i wanted to do podcast you know what this some other things some music too i dabble in that and um i just find that the only person you can rely on is yourself well, you're not wrong <laughs> you know, know. At, at, at the end of the day uh, you have to hold yourself accountable for your success and your happiness. And, you know, it, it, it takes a team from time to time, but at the end of the day, it, it's really on your own shoulders, what you make out of the short ride that we were talking about earlier and, and what you, what you put into it and what you get as a return. Yeah. But you have to learn. You know, you, you have to evolve and adapt and all those things. Um, and you have to have talent, you know, and a lot of luck, but a lot. You have to have a strong work ethic and you've got to absolutely to, uh, to really take chances. There's there's a lot that goes into it. Yeah. The more you have to become self-reliable, the more you have to learn and the more things you have to do and the more hats you have to wear. Sure. Um, but it seems to be the only way I found that. Um, it's really hard to find people who are as committed as you are to something, you know, to a marriage, to a band, to an instrument, to a craft. Relationships, man. Yeah. <laughs> They're tough. They're tough. Oh, yeah. I wanted to talk about Pat O'Brien for a second. Only about the Nevermore album. Wasn't he on a Nevermore album with the At dude from one, Argy? Yeah. Who's Jeff yeah. Loomis? Je Jeff Loomis, yes. I think yeah, the, they both of the them other. are on a, a Nevermore record. Politics that of is Ecstasy. True. It shreds, man. <laughs> They're both so amazing. Man, uh, Pat makes me look great. <laughs> I know Jeff. I know Jeff. Jeff is a really super nice guy, and Lord knows he's a hell of a player. So, uh, yeah. you know, I, I can't say enough good things about either one of them. I like them. And both as guitar players and as people. Yeah, but, that's great to hear, man. Back to New Orleans. New Orleans has carved out a sound and an identity, New Orleans metal, and New Orleans as, as a city. Um, I'm obsessed with thrash documentaries. I watch them all on Amazon, and they always go into East Coast, West Coast, East Coast, West Coast. And I think because of that, a band like Exhorter might have been lost a little bit because this is a little outside. But I think, like, my opinion is where East Coast, West Coast thrash took on influences of the new wave of British heavy metal. Exhorter and New Orleans seem to partake more in Sabbath. Yeah, I mean, and really give give a lot of credit to the traditional New Orleans music, the New Orleans rock and roll, mm -hmm. which some arguably believe that, you know, rock and roll was invented here. You have so much 
old, old stuff from the early days. Arma Thomas, uh, Clarence Frogman Henry, um, Frankie Ford. There's a lot of early rock and roll here that, you know, we all grew up listening to that. We all danced at the school fair. Did they all ask for you, uh, for you by the meters? You know, the, all this, the funk, the rock, it, it, it creeps into your blood. And I really think that along with Sabbath, which has that uh, backbeat, bluesy, jazz influenced rock um mm-hmm. that's definitely uh something that separates the new orleans scene you look at the the the, the classic west coast thrash bands like um exodus dark angel mm-hmm. slayer death angel um mm-hmm. forbidden you know there's there's so many you know without saying the obvious like metallica and megadeth of course sure uh, but you know that was a very like even today when when we sometimes we play festivals with these bands and and we have such a different thing about us than they do and 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 they uh you know I, i'm not saying ours is better and i'm not saying theirs no, is it's better different, necessarily though. it's just very different um you know not just in musical delivery but in stage presence mm-hmm. and uh the banter with the crowd i don't know i'm a i'm a smart ass clown and to me half the fun of getting up in front of a crowd is cracking stupid jokes and we did this when we were kids and i i haven't changed much but we don't take ourselves too seriously i mean how can when when you've got a song lyric that says you know <laughs> The, the tires on the Pope Mobile are slashed, steal his rings and pawn them in for cash. How can you take that too seriously? But, you know, we were angry with the church, so there's honesty in that as well. But it, a lot of what we do is tongue-in-cheek. You know, it, it's not unlike a horror movie. Yeah, like Lorenzo Ariola, we talked about this in my last episode. Um, we talked about separating the art from the artists you know whether you should do that or not you know and i think a lot of that they need to separate you from who you were at 20 or 16 yes not again this happened my last interview (laughs) i hear you for what for no reason (laughs) all right well give me about 15 more minutes yeah that's Uh. That's part of being dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like like my favorites are are obviously um I like after exorder. Uh, I I think acid bath would be next. You know, acid bath um is a very popular cult status band. Spectacular band. I think if they got back together, they'd be the biggest thing out there. Yeah, in my playlist, if you don't mind, I'd like to um you know, there's a corresponding playlist that I make. That everything we talk about, I'll, I'll put the Joan Jett video in there. You know, it's, it'll be a bunch of songs. But one thing I, I'd plan on putting was when you sang the blue at the NASA Bath tribute. Oh, it was um, it was tranquilized, tranquilized. And cheap, that's right, and and cheap vodka. Yes, yes, yes. That's for, that was pretty cheap cool to see. That was pretty cool it to was see. Fun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they invited me. They invited me to do that with them. Uh, I think Dax was either unavailable or uninterested. I can't remember. Um, so I reached out to him and asked for his blessing, and his response was, "I couldn't think of anyone else. I would rather do it." You know, I wanted to talk about Trouble a little bit, being that you're or the singer. You know, all the bands we mentioned, Alabama's Under Pussy, you know, Exorder, you've actually, there's a discography out there and you've recorded and put out material with all these bands. When did you get your travel tattoo? Yeah. It was short, it's shortly after I started working with them for the first time. And, you know, I was a fan long before I even knew the guys in the band, much less playing with them. So, uh, so for me to be a member of Trouble is like, like just as important as if I was in Black Sabbath to me. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, I see the influence of Trouble. I mean, Kirk from Crowbar, he has a Trouble tattoo as well. So it's got to be like so does really. Matt Brunson. It, yeah, yeah, that's right. The other guitar player from yep. Crowbar. Y'all have some shows coming up. Um, possibly. Uh, 
if everything goes right, we're supposed to be going back to uh, to Europe to play some uh, festival and tour dates that we had to postpone twice, unfortunately. Now it's just been insane with the pandemic and everything. But yeah, um, la- last I heard, we were supposed to still be playing some of those shows. So hopefully so. Um, we'll wait and see. I know we're we're in the process of, of you know, pre-production mm-hmm. for a new album, much like Exhorter is. Mm-hmm. Um, but, cool. you know, that, that a, a new Trouble album wouldn't come out before the new Exhorter album. We're just not that far along with the process yet i don't think i understand uh, but that's that's great that y'all are gonna work on some more material and i'm sure play live kyle yeah. you're busy uh anything you want to talk about alabama thunder pussy um well we just did that first show in 15 years uh right before the end of the year um last year and it went really really well we had a packed house mm-hmm. uh, we had a good time we're we're, we're working on uh, potentially doing some more shows at some point. Uh, you know, I, I think it would be overzealous for me to say that new material is coming or anything like that. Right now, sure. we're just we're just happy that we're back playing uh, <coughs> uh, a show that we just had a lot of fun at, um, mm-hmm. and potentially some more. So we really enjoyed each other's company, which is step one. You know? Yeah. Well, man, with that we'll circle back to Exhorter. I wanted to just tell you a personal story and we'll, we'll, we'll end. But um, I might have mentioned to you, I, I had a, um, a health scare, I guess you'd say. And um, I had to do a lot of rehab and exercises at the time. More in the Southern Skies came out. And um, during that time period, I listened to two songs almost every morning when I had to walk and exercise. It was Hollowed Sound. Yep. I remember, I think that was the first song I heard because it was released as a lyric video, I believe. Yeah, it sure was. Yeah, that song meant a lot. And then my time struck a chord with me because lyrically, the video, man, we've all worked for a guy like that, you know? Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. And I know I have, so. it's At some point, everybody wants to seize control of their life and not have to answer to anybody and, you know, it's a very liberating experience if you ever get to do it. Uh, it's, you know, you know, I, I no longer have a, a day job, but All I right. did for many, many years. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, sometimes it just feels like it's suffocating you and, oh, yeah. and there's no escape. And, and no, that's there isn't. when you, f- when you feel trapped, it's a terrible feeling. Oh, it's an awful feeling. I felt that before. And usually you're trapped by your job because, your job is 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 literally your family's lives are dependent on a job at that moment, you know? Yeah. It's a scary yep. feeling. And then when people above you take advantage of that, you know. Yeah. That that vulnerability. And I think that's what that song speaks to me. Um, but hey, at least the coffee's free, right? <laughs> that's the best part. <laughs> We'll end on that note. The coffee's free, Kyle. I appreciate it. And um I will be in touch. All right, Brad. Thank you, man. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks for taking time on your busy schedule, but um, I look forward to hearing your output in the next year. Good deal, man. Keep in touch. All right, Kyle. Bye. Thanks.